I want to switch gears and talk now on like the supplementation side of things, like over the counter. I was talking to vigorous Steve the other day and we were reminiscing on how crazy it was to be a kid in the fitness industry in like (laughs) 2006. And I listed off the shit that I just got over the counter that I know that people would literally murder for right now. Like I could walk into a GNC in Windsor, Ontario, and without batting a fucking eye, this little Lebanese lady would unlock this counter and hand me methylated testosterone. Like I know people that went into like (laughs) liver failure at like 18 years old. There was a drug called M test in Canada. Dimethylamine. It's like, you know, I have friends that have gone through like hard drug uh, rehabilitation and it was like, yeah, I was like, they explained to me what like crystal meth was. And like, remember when we used to take Jack 3d imagine like 10 (laughs) scoops. I'm like, the fact that you could make that comparison is insane to me because there does seem to be alongside the performance enhancement, uh, you know, uh, PED uh, development in education, uh, accessible information, whether it be good or bad, the supplement side has been equally, if not even more so uh, kind of um, maybe more prevalent. Like I remember, I don't know, I, I'm so nostalgic talking about this. Do you remember a supplement? I think it was like, oh, it's called Nano Vapor. Do you remember this? Do you know where I'm going with this? I do. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I... As a, an 18 or 19 year old, looking back, I sometimes cringe at what I spent some money on to try based on muscle tech ads or whatever. And then you're looking back and going, you're dumb as shit to fall so for like stupid. <laughs> there was one, this nano vapor container, I remember because it had a warning that you shouldn't leave the, the lid open for too long. So like we and my friend were like, just like disarming a fucking the uh, 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 proton b- bomb or something. I was like, okay, so I would. It was like when when in Lethal Weapon they're trying to pull the guy off the toilet when the bombs on the seat. He's like on three or like one two three then go. Because it was like, yeah, don't let the vapor get out. And I was like, what am I doing? Fucking nangs here? What do you mean? Let the vapor get out. What what have you seen has been the biggest improvements in either the quality of information or the quality of supplements? Like what are things that you think, you know, it, and maybe you can't say unequivocally, but like what are supplements that have emerged in the last 10 years that you're like, oh, wow, so amazing that this is now readily accessible? Uh, I think, uh, and to bring back to nostalgia, I think we've all been, we've all fallen prey for BCAA supplements like 10, 15 years ago of training, drinking BCAs, thinking BCAs are <laughs> this golden grail. And then you're like, hang on a minute. <laughs> that now we, we sort of see the beauty of like transparently dosed essential amino acid supplements where you're actually getting the full spectrum of what you need to incorporate into tissue from, from a nutrition perspective that we've all fallen for the hype of fancy foamy BCA products that you magically drink or, you know, the, the whole thing like with nano vapor, it still brings back a fond memory of me training with my dad when I was 19. And at the time using, um, say, as we said, nano vapor, Createch, did you ever Createch? Yeah. Oh yeah. Everything. Muscle, muscle text creatine. It was literally 70 grams of sugar with five grams of creatine and literally post-workout mixing it up, drinking it. And within like 15 minutes, spewing my guts up because of it was basically maltodextrin and dextrose. <laughs> your, stomach, your stomach couldn't absorb that much sugar in one go for trying. <laughs> oh, yeah. But like, you know, we were, we were all sold on the science that you needed sugar to drive creatine synthesis that is now just, there's that much research that we know it's not, it just doesn't need to happen. That, that, that space that we're in now in terms of like the transparency uh, I think proprietary formulas are now pretty much, I guess, non-defunct in the, the supplement industry. That no one, no one can hide quality behind a, a proprietary blend. I get years ago it was great that it was sort of like an IP thing between companies of this is what we're doing versus what the others are doing. But again, it was all there was no internet really to speak, so you had to rely on what was being advertised in store or in a magazine, you didn't really have, like now I can just print a Google, I can compare like 10 different products in the space of minutes to see who who's actually truly dosing. What does the research say? What does here, there, everywhere? You couldn't do that when we were like 19, 20. It was, it was sort of like you were 
you were taking it with a pinch of salt to what was being said in the magazine as a naive kid, basically. And then obviously we all, as we all age, we ask more, more critical questions. And I guess now with social media, like you said, there's people like us who, who are speaking out, you know, that was one of the first things that I really spoke out about supplementation wise, when we started doing things with supplement needs was everything that we created was dosed to how the literature said. So the products were going to cost a little bit more, but I couldn't morally create a product that firstly I want to take personally to make it for me and then have someone else take it knowing that it's half dosed or hidden proprietary blend where you're mixing a small bit of active ingredients like a pre-workout and knowing that like 400 milligrams of it is caffeine or DMAA, like you said, where people are like, this is great stuff. And it's clearly because you've got black market <laughs> stimulants hidden inside the product. <laughs> what uh, if you were to, I mean, just saying quickly, yeah. like if you, you know, you said you like go across Google now and I can compare side by side. What do you look for? Like if, if someone were to sit there like, okay, if God, I don't think kids listen to this because I'm not on TikTok and I usually, you know, I'm disparaging to anyone with dangly earrings. But <laughs> if God bless, there's a few that listen, tell your friends, like what now and maybe how has this evolved over the years? Like, what do you look for? Like, hey, pre-workout, for example, what is at what dose? These things are kind of like the best ergogenic aids that we can get that aren't. I, th I think we, we've now like w one of the ones that is really like, sort of esteemed and we've got so much research on is like how citrulline plays into like the arginine and ornithine cycle for blood flow delivery so we've done that many sort of human trials to speak that six grams of pure l citrulline is like what you're looking for clinically in a like a pump a pump aspect of a pre-workout whereas you look back at our time again like reminiscing it was all like citrulline malate, which is like a two is to one citrulline to malic acid. So you got people being very clever, putting six grams of citrulline malate into the pre-workout, which was really just three grams of citrulline overall. So they're sort of bending the truth a little bit to save a bit of money because pure citrulline is a lot more expensive than citrulline malate. So in that aspect, you sort of see where the transparency of the industry changes, where no one uses, unless they actually sort of state that they're using citrulline malate for malic acid has some properties towards uh, metabolic buffering. You won't find anyone really using citrulline malate now in a pump formula because of they're going to be called out for it unless they, like I said, they're transparent and say we're using it because of this. Another one that is... Uh, quite quite well sort of established would be beta alanine towards like um generating carnosine in the body but again beta alanine is one of these ones that you either like or you don't because of the paresthesia like the itchiness that comes to your face from the beta alanine <laughs> which we had a nice discussion a few years ago that Sometimes people put that in a product, not just for the ergogenic benefit, but for the psychological aspect. So someone takes a pre-workout, feels a tingling on their face, like, oh, the pre-workout is now working. It's one that I've never used in any of our products, just because it, it's it's one of those ones where people like either like their face melting before they go into the gym, or they don't. <laughs> yeah, set me on fire. So, I need to feel something. Uh, and that, that way, you, like, you know, and that, that's like another, like a psychosomatic association that the, the product's working. Caffeine can take like 60 to 90 minutes to peak, whereas beta alanine can take 15 to 20. So you're still in the middle of your set. The caffeine is still peaking, but because the beta alanine's kicked in, you think it's it's raring to go and it's all in your system. Um, What else has sort of changed? We've... We've now become a little more complex in that we we appreciate like the beauty of nitric oxide. So now you've got like a lot of um, nitrate sources that are going into products, new nitrate ingredients, and you see novel ones come out all the time. So we're pretty we're pretty much in a nice position now, 10, 12 years on into how I feel the industry changed, where we've we've got more innovation happening we've got a lot more pharmaceutical companies paying attention more so to nutraceutical development than to actual pharmaceutical development 
I, I, I mean, every two or three weeks, I get new emails from different manufacturers of we've created this new trademark form of a type of nitrate or a type of a um, new ergogenic ingredient. And you start to see that's probably <clears throat> a negative that I'm going to speak about where we are in the industry and that everyone feels the need to have this like trademarked or painted as an ingredient in their products or their products are useless. Completely disregarding some of like the, the I guess, well-established ingredients. So yes, you have to have a selling point in terms of like some novelty, but a lot of companies are looking for what trademarked ingredient can I put in when there already exists a non-trademarked form you just need to make sure that the purity is correct. And so you do find that some consumers do get a little bit, not to be harsh, but like snobby in that they will compare that, oh, your pre-workout doesn't have this form of, you know, <clears throat> a while back it was amino acids. You had to be Kiowa fermented amino acids when, to be honest, there's no difference between a Kiowa amino acid and a generic one, just that Kiowa's name is on it and you're paying probably four times the price. I saw one the other day that was, and look, I don't know anything about anything, but I saw one the other day that was bragging about the type of salt they use. And I was like, dude, I'll lick fucking road salt <laughs> off the sidewalk. Is this where we're at? We're at salt now. We're at salt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm judging by your laughter that I may have been correct in being like, I don't give a fuck if you have patented yeah, salt. Uh, uh, and that's one thing, like you get now where it's like Celtic sea salt, Himalayan salt in the pre-workout. In in our pump product, in pre-pump, we have, I think it's one gram of sea salt. And that's just like plain sea salt that's gone into the product that you could easily take salt and put on your food before you go train. Like, <clears throat> yeah. that's like what, how... How direct and transparent I have been with our supplements has been just like that, that there is no BS of like fancy Himalayan salt or like I said, Celtic sea salt, because there doesn't need to be. You, what you're doing there is like marketing hype to hide something that is just the most basic level of nutrition again, salt intake. Well, it's funny because I see a trend when we talked about like PEDs and we talked about them from a performance and we talked about them from a longevity standpoint. And it seems like the research has always been on the cutting edge and at least at the level of application of research when it comes to actually the performance enhancing side. And where I see, just like where I, I'm seeing now with, uh, with hormone replacement therapy, when I look to the supplement world, I see now the real charlatans being... Like the lack of transparency is in like the longevity and health space, just like where the charlatans in sub or in PED use are now actually in like the longevity and health space. It's like, you know, when I'm, cause there's another, I guess there's another line of questioning around supplementation and, and it's the, this fucking plague of boomer podcast banging on about like Tongat Ali or uh, <laughs> Ashwagandha. And it's just like, is it safe to say that like that this is the new frontier of bad information is coming out of like things that are making longevity claims. It's very easy to test for performance. My skin is scratching yeah. off. I want to go train. Uh, what I'm supposed to wait until I die at 85. Like what's the KPI here? Like from, from like a formulation perspective and like supplement formulator perspective, testosterone boosters are one thing that I will never make. And I've said this, I've made a post on it explaining the science of how testosterone is made in your body. <clears throat> Unless you can actively, two things basically drive testosterone production in a male's body. One, interestingly, is estradiol suppresses the hypothalamus. So if you can block estradiol's effect onto your hypothalamus, you'll produce more gonadotropin-releasing hormone, the stimulating hormone that drives LH. So that's sort of where years ago you seen like, and I was laughing because I was preparing content on this, formistane was an over-the-counter supplement, which is, which is an aromatase inhibitor. So when there was like the metal tests, pro-hormone era, you could get formistane as a supplement, which is basically an AI. <laughs> And that would naturally, obviously, lower your t your estrogen because you're blocking aromatase, but naturally your testosterone would go up as a consequence. So unless you can block estradiol acting on your brain, you improve then that secretion of LH, or you tell the hypothalamus, 
pump out more gonadotropin releasing hormone to get the pituitary to make more LH because LH is what causes steroid creation in the, the testicle. To my knowledge, there's nothing really that does that. You can get natural aromatase inhibitors like white button mushroom and there's one of the mechanisms that they think about Tonka Ali is that it does lower aromatase expression, which would then artificially increase your testosterone because instead of converting to estrogen, testosterone is staying as testosterone. But it's not increasing your testosterone production overall. You're just gaining back testosterone that would naturally go down the estradiol pathway. So testosterone boosters, they're still, you know, one of the things that's carried around from I'm not going to say our young era, but like the last 20 years that are still there playing on people's insecurity of take this supplement to give you more vitality, give you more testosterone, playing purely off marketing hype that morally it's just one supplement that I could never, ever create because you either have testosterone being made in abundance by the testicle naturally because of the whole hormonal cascade or you don't. 